and welcome everyone to tonight's presentation. Let's start with uh, continue in prayer before I introduce our presenters this evening. And I'm going to use the while it is the this this is pretty fantastic that the timing of our um, first in the series of dialogues is occurring during the prayer. Uh, the week of prayer for Christian unity. So very happy to welcome uh, Pastor Lynette Sparks of Westminster uh, Church here in Grand Rapids and Sister Maureen Geary from uh, the Grand Rapids Dominicans at Marywood. Um, the prayer I'm going to use, however, tonight is the prayer for the Synod, which I think is just as fitting as a prayer of uh, mm. unity for Christians. Um, so would you join me, please, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We come before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name. With you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in our hearts. No. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. I didn't even hear you. We are weak and sinful. Unless, Do not I'm let here. us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path, nor partiality influence our actions. Let us find in you our unity so that we may journey together to eternal life and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you who are at work in every time and place in communion with the Father and the Son forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So very happy to welcome Sister Maureen Geary, a member of the Grand Rapids Dominicans. She has served in congregational leadership for the past 16 years. And prior to that, she ministered at Aquinas College, as well as with the Secretary for Social Justice for the Diocese of Grand Rapids, and with the Kent County Coalition to End Homelessness. The Dominican sisters strive to live emboldened by faith, serving with joy. And the Reverend Lynette Sparks has served as Senior Pastor and Head of Staff at Westminster Presbyterian Church since June of 2020. She had quite a time, uh, as you all may remember, when she moved in here to Grand Rapids and uh, and then got everyone else was shut down as well. So, but previously she served at Third Presbyterian Church in Rochester, New York, and at Wright's Corner Presbyterian Church in Lockport, New York. Lynette received her uh, Master of Divinity from Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School in Rochester, New York. And she holds a BA in Business Administration and Accounting from Augustinia, University in South Dakota, and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Committed to the social gospel, she hopes to help the church build God's beloved community together in a world that's otherwise fractured. Would you please help me welcome Sister Maureen Geary and the Reverend Lynette Sparks. Well, good evening, everyone. Lynette and I are going to get along just great because we're both accountants at heart. That's my first degree also, which I just love. Uh, we are in a great high-tech room here, and we are going to share a microphone. We're sharing a screen. I'm going to try to remember to look in the right places, but we've got a great um, audience on site or participants on site as well. So it is good to be here with you, and we're going to each provide maybe 15 minutes of some remarks. We'll have a little dialogue back and forth, but really this is a participative um, conversation. It's not a lecture, so uh, hopefully you'll be awake throughout most of it. And I'm going to begin with the recognition as we're talking about this theme of mission and co-participation, co-responsibility. The church has left the building. You may have heard that uh, said when COVID first hit. And as Lynette and I were talking, we remembered that um, reaction. The church has left the building. We first heard this. I think, during the early months of COVID as glad tidings. It was a way of saving, of saying to each other, um, we're still people of faith. We're still engaged in our faith journey. At that time, we were not, most of us were not in our church buildings, but we recognized our faith identity, uh, even in the absence of the opportunity to safely gather to worship together at church. So what we did was to acknowledge that being believers as church did not require us to be at church. We carried on with personal prayer. Many of us participated in devotions or church services, mass, remotely, virtually, however you like to say that. Um, faith sharing groups really blossomed, we've, we've heard and we know. 
And as we could during that time of pandemic, uh, many of us participated in service or outreach, this sense of the church being out in the world as the pandemic restrictions allowed. And so I would ask the question of those participating during this time, did we experience ourselves to be people of faith and followers of the gospel? I think so. I know so. A little time goes on and we hear the church has left the building. And now we're hearing it sometimes in a bit of a more worrisome tone. Some are struggling with declining church attendance. Some folks haven't gone back for various reasons. And so we miss, in some cases, the communal worship. And uh, some might be coming of the mind that at church is the only way to live out our faith. So I think our dialogue today is not about claiming one or the other as the truth, but it's really about looking at both ways that we live out our faith at church and as church. And that that's how we claim the rich faith life and the gospel work, the mission to which we are all called. So we're here this evening, as Mark has already said, as part of a conversation about the synod on synodality, which was convened by Pope Francis in 2021. I have a couple of quotes from Pope Francis to remind us of what was going on in his mind at that time. And one of the things he said was, celebrating a synod is always a good and important thing, but it proves truly beneficial if it becomes a living expression of being church of a way of acting marked by true participation. All the baptized are called to take part in the church's life and mission. And so the Pope goes on to use some of the language that our Paulus fathers here use of encounter, listening, and reflection. Listening, journeying together, building relationship. And I do want to call out a gratitude to the Paulus fathers in whose beautiful place here we're gathered. Um, in their 2022 General Assembly for that religious community of, of priests and brothers, I think they're, I don't remember if it's Paulist brothers, I should know that, uh, but our Paulist brethren, they invite parishioners, they invite the public to a sacred space where encounter, accompaniment, and dialogue with one another can truly flourish. They talk about synodality as a way of walking together. And so again, just to situate ourselves in this dialogue around mission in the world, um, I do want to comment that as the first phase of this synod of synodality has taken place, there's been a worldwide um, compilement, compilation of the input that's come in from all over the world. And the document that we're studying right now in the continental phase is called Widen the Space of Your Tent. Again, this is all great. Uh, set up for what we're doing here today to talk about mission, co-responsibility for being the church in the world. And one other thing is I began talking about as church and at church, we don't want to set up dualities. Um, we want to talk about both and, not either or. And in a recent interview, Pope Francis again emphasized that in terms of Catholicism, Catholics cannot think either or. We must be thinking both and. And that uh, statement or that uh, philosophy really comes out of our Protestant theologian friend, Karl Barth, who is the one who emphasized the both and of Catholicism. And so we come here this evening thinking that there's a lot of ways that we are church and that we are in mission. And we're talking tonight about kind of the church in the world. So my sharing this evening before I hand this over to Lynette for a bit is really gonna talk about some illustrations I don't have any answers. I don't have any dogma. Um, some illustrations about how is it that we might be, that we already are, that we see others being the church in the world and this co-responsibility for the mission of Christ in the world. And so I just did a little freeform thinking about what I've been encountering since this invitation to be a part of this dialogue. I have maybe three or four examples. I'll see how long-winded I get before I hand over the microphone. And then Lynette and I will have some dialogue after we hear hers as well. So one of the first things that really struck me, um, a few months ago, I was introduced to a Jesuit podcast from the English Jesuits, and it's called Pray As You Go. So I got it on my phone. Someone told me about it. And I listened to it while driving to work. 
and while out walking. It's about 12 to 14 minutes a day. And um, a recent episode was focused on a recent reading from Isaiah in which um, I, I'm gonna use a couple of the quotes from the reading and I'm gonna pose the really bold questions that were posed on this podcast. So one of the phrases from Isaiah, and he said to me, you are my servant, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And so the podcast presenter then says to we, the listeners, Christmas is over and Jesus starts out in his work of preaching the gospel. And so, of course, do we at this time. How do you recognize yourself as a part of this? So I'm going to pose that question. You joined in this evening. How do you recognize yourself as a part of this mission of preaching the gospel? The reading from Isaiah continues. To bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. And the question posed on the podcast, might that restoration of harmony be a part of your mission this week? Maybe that's a way we live the gospel, live the mission in the world, a restoration of harmony in our world, which is so disharmonious. And then lastly, the phrase from Isaiah, I will give you as a light for the nations. And the podcast person asks, are these words spoken to you, a light for the nations? Are you up for it? Is there anything that now demands a response from you? So I just use this little vignette as a way to say, we're called to be on the mission, in the mission of Christ in the world. And again, I think as you listen this evening and begin dialogue with each other, are these words spoken to you? Are you up for it? Is there anything that now demands a response from you? That's my first example. My second one is from a report I read that was submitted to the Synod. And it was written by the Sisters of Charity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. They're out in Dubuque, Iowa. It's a really challenging report after their listening as a congregation. This is what they wrote. We affirm a church that prioritizes the expansion of mission over the preservation of power. The church we affirm honors Eucharistic moments where God is encountered in acts of justice and in relationships with all beings. We are called to be the church of the acts of the apostles. We are called to be the church that does what Jesus did, heal, preach, challenge, accompany, journey, listen. Wow, again, challenge. And so I go back to my podcast and I say, are these words spoken to you? Are they spoken to me? Am I up for it? Are you up for it? Is there anything as I hear this that now demands a response from me? So perhaps that I'm not only at church, but I'm acting as church wherever I am. And I am going to skip ahead in my notes to one other example, because I think I'm running out of time a little bit. We'll circle back as we need to. This one was very timely to our celebration in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. It's a familiar story you'll recognize, the Good Samaritan. We're all familiar with how that story unfolds. And yet this is the challenge that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. posed to us. We are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside. That's an example of mission. There's no doubt about it. But he says that will be only an initial act. One day, we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be changed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. True compassion comes to see that an edifice, a roadway, a building, an institution, an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. What I hear in this, these prophetic words from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
are the invitation to remember the both and of direct action and advocacy. So we tend to the needs that present themselves at the roadside. And we ask, why are these needs here? And how might I be a part through legislative advocacy, through voting, through uh, community organizing to change that roadway and that edifice? So I am going to stop there with my few examples of getting us into this mindset of being acting as church and invite Lynette to share some wisdom. Thanks, uh, Sister Marine. Uh, this is such a joy. You know, I heard about Sister Marine from a mutual acquaintance uh, early on when I came to Grand Rapids, and it's taken until more recent months that we've actually been able to connect in person, uh, but it has been worth the wait. Um, so this is this is really, really a joy. And so Mark and and all of you, I want to thank you for this invita invitation to uh, join this conversation. Now, I, I want to give you a, a couple of inside scoops into the Presbyterian world, because I know that uh, many of you are um, part of this uh, process here in uh, your diocese and your synod and synodality. I hope I can say that word. It's kind of a big word. Um, but it's a good one. Um, um, I love this process. And I want to let you know that, uh, you know, we Presbyterians, we have a constitution. And um, part two of that constitution is really rather unimaginatively named. It's called the Book of Order. I think synodality is just a much more you know, kind of exciting name, but we have this 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 thing called this book of order. But in spite of that sort of uninteresting name, it's a really wonderful document that guides our tradition and its basis is deeply, deeply theological. And in part, you know, what, what excites me is it also affirms what we are seeking to explore tonight. And, and this is one of the things that it says. It says, and I quote, because in Christ, the church is one, it strives to be one. To be one with Christ is to be joined with all those whom Christ calls into relationship with him. And division into different denominations obscures, but does not destroy unity in Christ. And so we in, in the Presbyterian Church USA, we affirm our historical continuity with the whole church of Jesus Christ. And that's what I think tonight's about. Um, and committed to the reduction of that obscurity and is willing to seek and to deepen communion with all other churches within the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So I find that really powerful. And so that, again, is what, what I think we're about tonight, sharing that common mission for when we think about God's mission in the world to usher in the kingdom of God, uh, by definition, that has to be a shared task. That has to be shared work because it's Christ that's called us into the church, uh, in the church into being and into God's mission in the world. So um, again, by definition, we have got to be collaborators, co-creators in that. And, and I'm a really practical person. I'm very much of a practitioner. And, and so I love the practical side about this as well, because you know, we all know in our congregations and the places that we're involved that volunteers are stressed out. And sometimes we wonder, where's the money going to come for this project or that project? And so, you know, this, this, the deeply theological work of collaboration and mission partnerships is not only theological, it's practical. And I, I, you know, I know we have an esteemed theologian in the room here in person, and uh, I cannot speak for him, but um, I, I can only imagine, um, you know, theology doesn't exist to be in, you know, just sort of floating out here with us. It, it informs our life and our faith and how we live. So um, just another little bit of word about my background, which informs a lot of what I want to share with you tonight, is that much, many of my perspectives come from my work 
in Rochester, New York, where I was uh, in a congregation um, similar to Westminster in a city similar size to Grand Rapids. And I was the pastor for all things mission and justice. So um, a lot of what I'm going to share is it comes out of that experience and of my many, many teachers um, there. So um, how do we think about co-responsibility? Um, you know, this community that we live in, it's ours. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's ours. So the issues and the problems are ours. And how then we think about mission, I think, also then has important implications for that. And, and one of the things I found helpful is to think about mission as a continuum. And I want to give um, credit to my former colleagues, uh, Rod Froman and Jim Evinger in Rochester for um, kind of articulating this continuum in a way that I think is really helpful. And that's to think about that continuum between charity and development. And I think Sister Maureen alluded to some of those kinds of things in her comments. So when we think about charity on on this end, you know, charity is something that meets a short-term need. It offers immediate relief. It, it serves individuals. It does things for others. Um, you know, you, you give somebody hungry something to eat. And then on this end of the con continuum is, is development, right? Um, it, it continues over time. It, it, it works on after there's a crisis that you're responding to. It it's, it takes the long view, and it develops both individuals and communities. It it helps people do for themselves and strengthens their capacity. Um, and then um, you know, so you have charity on one end and development on the other. And there's really a range of things in between. So if you again, you can drill that down further. The the purest or the, the simplest form of charity is, is that immediate need, but, but it really lacks content or contact, excuse me, with the people that you serve. So for example, you see someone on the street who's hungry, you hand them a sandwich or hand them, uh, you know, I guess these days, at least a $10 bill to go buy some lunch um, and you walk on your way. Or you're, you're, you or your an organization, you know, writes a check to somebody um, mails it off, but you have no further involvement. That's charity. Um, we're always going to need that. That's, you know, that's always the case. Um, and it's not the only thing to think about a mission. Then you can take charity another step and you can think about relationship charity. So that's where you're also, in addition to helping someone's immediate need, um, you know, building a relationship with that person. So let's say your church is one that offers a hot meal every week to your, the neighbors in your community and volunteers get to know them as they come in week after week. And you sit down at the table with them and you eat with them and you learn to know them. That takes that charity act further and, and really sort of develops that sense that, you know, we're all humans in this together. And, um, um, begins to de develop relationships. And then as you move toward further on the, you know, the development side, um, you know, there are, are things that you can do that, that create relationships that, that lead you to kind of bond your lives together. And it helps individuals or communities function, helps them become more self-sufficient. So for example, um, you know, tutoring in schools might be one of those examples, right? So uh, my congregation in Rochester um, had a, a formal memorandum of agreement with the city schools. And um, within the city schools, um, partnered with two elementary schools with very low academic achievement rates um, and ran tutoring programs there and spent part of our mission money to hire two tutoring coordinators. Its coordinators worked with the school administration and recruited tutors. And the school said, these are our students who need help. And the church said, these are our volunteers that want to do this. And those coordinators put them together. So one coordinator got leveraged into 50 volunteers who got leveraged into 150 children who got a half hour of one-on-one -on -one tutoring every week. Um, again, one example I lifted up because it wasn't my idea, 
um, um, but the faithful people of, in, in that community are doing that kind of work. And then, you know, probably on the furthest end of the, the development side is really what we might think of as community development, where you are creating opportunities um, for long-term self-sufficiency, for uh, um, addressing those really big social es um, issues. And, and one of the examples I would lift up that, you know, that I know that the Cathedral of St. Andrew is involved with, that Westminster and other churches are, um, is the recently formed uh, Together West Michigan broad-based organization, which is building relationships of trust among people and among institutions here locally across lines of economics and race um, to have conversations and listen into the community and listen into the marginalized communities, hear what their needs are and work with them uh, to kind of um, begin to think about what are the, the, the broader policy and structural changes that we can make. And so, you know, I think that that especially the further you go on that continuum from charity to development, the further you go along, you have to do it together. It cannot be done alone. Um, you know, so in, in cases, there are things that that one institution will take the lead on and the rest of us will join in with. Um, another institution may take the lead on this item and we'll join in together. But those are are really powerful. And for me personally, I just, it is so energizing. It's been energizing to my faith and to my um, theology. Um, you know, whether it's the, uh, you know, the ecumenical food pantry, which kind of, you know, falls a little bit more on the left side or the earlier side of that continuum. You know, there are multiple churches here, including the cathedral and our other downtown churches who are partnering with that. Um, so, so again, I think, I think that is the future of mission. We can't all think of it together or we can't all think of it individually, but we can certainly um, do it together and, and it enriches the faith of all of us. So I do want to share a few um, examples or a few lessons, again, that I learned from my great teachers in Rochester, um, not because they're the be-all and end-all, but really, again, to just kind of stimulate our imaginations as to what might be possible. Um, and um, I won't share them all. You know, it could be, um, you know, it could be collaborating with, um, you know, emergency funding. Uh, as we try to meet the needs of our neighbors and, and they're coming to our different institutions. Um, you know, uh, in Rochester was an example of a, of a fundraiser that started out, um, a, a 5K that started out to, to fund our food ministries. It eventually grew so big that it raised more money than our own food ministries could use. So it started to get distributed to food ministries throughout the city, run by all kinds of churches. Um, even, you know, thinking about uh, systemic change, um, that is the hardest work, I think. Um, but for those who love a challenge, um, it's a good one. And, and I think that this, the statement that I'll make there is, is really understanding our context is so important. And getting good data and a good understanding of our context um, and, and that's, you know, for me as a newcomer to Grand Rapids has kind of been an interesting challenge, figuring out, you know, where, how can we dig down and drill down to really understand, um, you know, where is poverty concentrated? Where are those dividing lines? Um, you know, especially in the days of uh, declining local journalism, which historically has been a source of, of, information, common information that we all have access to. Um, I could say a whole lot more about that, but I will, will um, save that. But I, I think one last thing, um, you know, as I've reflected on, on the past couple of years and coming out of pandemic and Sister Marine and I were talking about this the other day, you know, the pandemic has been hard on so many people. We've been isolated. And I truly believe 
that as we reach out together, you know, we've all been wounded by that. And it's certainly not the only thing that is going to heal us, but I think our reaching out to one another and our community and doing it together is going to be an important part of our collective healing from our collective trauma. So I'm um, excited to continue this conversation and get to work. Those 15 minutes go fast. So, uh, you know, um, Sister Reen, I'm going to pop back to you and some of the things that you said. Um, if I can find my page where I took my notes. There it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know, your comment about the church has left the building. You know, that, again, that really resonates with us as Presbyterians. Um, you know, in our, in our tradition, we say that our worship doesn't end at the end of a worship service, but it continues as we go out in the world. Um, and so, again, that doesn't negate the idea, right, that our gathering together matters for, we know that, and, and I think pandemic really taught us that too. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but when people came back into our facility, uh, you know, for the first time after being away, they were in tears, right? So, so the sacred space matters. And the holy is also found in the sacred space of being with the other. Yeah. And so that, um, that really resonated. Any, anything more that you want to say about the church leaving the building? Because I think that's, that's really powerful. I think, again, it's, it's uh, wanting to stress the both and, and, you know, in the, in the Catholic tradition, and I am not a liturgist and uh, not really expert in a lot of this, but we have a dismissal right where, you know, it, it's not just about gathering. I remember um, I did study a couple of years at CTU, Catholic Theological Union, and I had a professor there who talked about our attendance at mass is not about um sort of our our weekly cosmetology visit. Now I'm not talking about cosmology, cosmetology, go to get your hair done. So he talked about that experience that coming to worship is not just about looking good or kind of uh, I'll feel good when I'm there, but it's it's that charge when you leave the the communal worship to take this now out into the world. And so um, I, I just really want to emphasize that. And I truly believe that we're fed by our communal worship, by our faith sharing groups as well. Um, it can be small, it can be large. And as you were talking in a couple of other notes I had written down, I think for me, scripture is really important. Mm. So to, to, to choose some examples that we may hear in the Sunday readings or weekday readings, in the preaching, in our, in our faith sharing, where Jesus did that 2000 years ago or Isaiah long before him, how does that apply to me today? And what, what, what is the translation and what is the impetus to take this faith with me out into the world? So I, I, I'm a, just a firm believer in that. And we need the feeding. We need to be fed by coming together and we need to, I believe we need to do something with it, be something with it. Yeah, I think, you know, in response to that, especially the doing, I, you know, I've been thinking about um, how our different generations are engaging or in many cases not engaging with the church. And, um, you know, anecdotally, uh, as as I observe younger generations of of which um, I am <laughs> not not that but but you know i know that our young people our young adults are really you know that it it may actually the the front door or the the entryway into the church for them may not first be through worship at least in our tradition again i cannot speak for others um but it that i think we have to be thinking about multiple doors multiple openings and and i i my thesis, my working thesis, is that for many, especially in our younger generations who who have a sense of justice and and, and see things, they, they care about the climate, they care about um, racial equity, they care about um, you know uh, eliminating um, economic inequities. Um, you know, they see that in, in many ways much more clearly um, than, than many in my generation do. And, 
and uh, you know, and they want they they want to be involved somewhere that is walking that walk, and um, so I, I think often about those multiple doorways into the church, and what does that mean, even not just for going out, but kind of coming back in. I'm glad you mentioned a couple of those examples. Um, one of the ponderings I had, there's a, some of you may be familiar with an organization called Nuns and Nuns. So it's Nuns, N-U-N-S, Sisters, and it's Nuns, N-O-N-E-S, as in I don't claim any of that. So it was a group that's formed of, um, to kind of connect religious sisters, nuns, with uh, seekers. Another term for that, that our local group has called itself sisters and seekers. A little bit of a long-winded introduction here, but there's a, a young woman named Katie Gordon who's been very instrumental in that. And I was reading a reflection of hers. Katie was in Grand Rapids. Uh, she was very involved with us over at Marywood. Um, Sister Lucille, who's here, has been a part of that group. Um, in exploring um, from the perspective of those who may not claim a faith tradition, may be skeptical, may be claim to be non-believers, I'm a nun, N-O-N-E, or just not have not come to that encounter yet. But Katie has gone off and done remarkable things. And most recently, she has lived for a few years with the Erie Benedictine Sisters, which is a particular expression of religious life, Benedictines. Sister Joan Chittister is kind of famous. Some of you may have heard of her. And so Katie has lived with them. And I, I don't know Katie real well personally, but I think, I think it's accurate to say she's a seeker. She's really seeking for what is this manifestation of God in my life. And she offered a reflection. I won't read it to you, but which I, I really, uh, she quoted a, a monk from some time ago, asking the question about community. Because again, we're talking about co-responsibility here as a community. It may be formed as a faith community in a church, a place of worship. But in this example that she gave, kind of um, juxtaposed, again, it's not an either or, but it's a less thing, both and, the question of institution. Institution could become a fortress. It could become separate. But our institution that we're both speaking of is also one that builds and encompasses community. So the other word that Katie uses in her reflection is community as an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the climate, the ecology, but an ecosystem of building and forming people and connections. And those people then take their own passions and are led to be out in the world bringing about change. So again, I think it can come from so many different ways, whether or not we claim uh, we may be from a different interfaith tradition, not Christianity. We might not claim to be Christ in the world, but we certainly would claim to be the spirit in the world, bringing about goodness and change. Sister Maureen and Lynette, one of the <clears throat> words that has been key in the signal process and really was introduced by Pope Benedict um, when he was Pope was this idea of co-responsibility. That shared sense of mission is a co-responsibility. I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. All right, I'll I'll take a feeble stab at it, and uh, Maureen will kind of clean up afterwards. Okay. Off that. Sounds good. Um, you know, we um, again, I think back to. Uh, even back back to creation and God creating the world and creating humanity and creating you know, God's very act of creation was was an act of co-responsibility in a sense, I believe. Um, and so, uh, you know, Jesus calling his disciples was an act of co-responsibility showing us the way to do that back to maureen's point about yes everything we do is is rooted in that scripture story that shapes our life and our meaning and our faith and so it's 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 right there it's it's scriptural whether you're a protestant or catholic um and um and that's very countercultural. you know i think in today's world yeah, I've I've had this conversation with other colleagues, you know, thinking about what is 
you know, my again, my thesis on what's the number one idolatry in our idolatry in our American culture is that the idolatry of the individual and individualism. Not that not that it's completely bad, but we have elevated the individual above the common good. I think to an to an extent that I don't my personal interpretation of scripture doesn't support. I mean, we are created to be co-responsible. And so um, doing that really uh, together is a countercultural act today, especially in this country. I'm glad that you went back to Genesis. I also had that quickly go through my mind, the act of creation, the, way, the stories that we tell about it. Um, I guess another piece that comes to mind uh, for me uh, would be the challenge to us as believers to recognize that um, I maybe it goes back a little bit to that cosmetology piece, but it isn't just about what I get out for my shiny little soul by attending a worship service, but it's about I'm there with a community of believers and of seekers, maybe a lot struggle with the belief, but we're seekers. And so um, we really are called to to do something with that uh, at whatever our level of ability is. And I think the other thought that crosses my mind, I'm, I honestly don't know in detail exactly what um, may be uh, fully explored in the materials, but I would raise the challenge that co-responsibility in this Christian tradition would be, it's not about looking to the vowed religious, somehow I should know more or be more and be more responsible. It's not about looking to the ordained and say, yeah, that's where the duty is and I'll follow along. It's not even about the theologian that says, you know, you're trained in the study of theology, therefore you know more than I do. It's really what peace can I claim with the gifts I have that um, that I put them to use, and that I call out those gifts in the people around me, and recognize that deep listening, that calling forth, that invitation, that recognition that each one of us has something to offer, even um, the radical idea that the one we're serving, that person who's being served, is serving me too, because I'm in that encounter, I'm in that relationship. So I probably would call out those themes. Thank you. Um, I had one other thought or question for you to respond to, and that's, um, I recall you each reminded me of this when you were reflecting, Sister, on Martin Luther King Jr.'s point about there is the helping the person, the, the Good Samaritan who helps the person on the road to Jericho, and then there's addressing the road. And you talked about it in the larger concepts of there's charity and there's development. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and kind of in the same theme, back to the maybe the side of charity, I recall Chesterton in reflecting on the life of St. Francis, he talked about the difference between being a philanthropist, a lover of humanity, and then there was Francis, who was a lover of human persons. Mm -hmm. And he simply loved the person who was in front of him um, while working to, as he was called, to rebuild the church. Right, it is, as the as the story goes about his life, particular. But I wonder if you can share a little bit more, break that open a little bit more about that difference between. And I think some of it you alluded to, Lynette, in talking about you can write a check, your organization can write a check, and that's good, right? There's good cause. We need that. We need some finance, financial resources, right, outlaid to be able to help move some of the projects along. But then there is working with the people who are right next to us and the gifts that are shared. Go ahead. Oh, oh, you've hit on something for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I think in in many of our cities, you know, where I came from, I, I, I see it here too. Our our communities are very philanthropic. I mean, a good thing where we tend to be long on philanthropy and and I, in my mind, I think about the, the difference between philanthropy and justice. And and when I say justice, I'm talking about you know, the kind of justice that, uh, you know, that the prophet Micah talks about, um, again, the, the, um, the, you know, equity among humanity and creation and, um, you know, the, the, the realizing of the full humanity of, of every person. And, um, so, so, you know, even, and I think philanthropy can be in service 
to that. I would love to see philanthropy more in service to that development and and justice work. Um, you know, again, even as we're we're doing um, the charity, but but even philanthropy itself, right, is is a bit. Um, well, sometimes I've heard the word undemocratic. Um, but but it's it's a bit fraught, right? It, it, you know, in our our broad based organizing circles, we're we're thinking about how do we use the power that we have for the common good, and and how do we look at power imbalances, right? You, you know, God is is thinking about power imbalances. It may not be the language that's used in scripture, but you know, you're looking at a a, a, a tiny um, you know marginalized nation. Uh, you know, in a Roman empire uh, that is oppressed. I mean, that's a power dynamic. And and so how do you, you know, in the world of philanthropy, um, it's it's very much, you know, whoever has the most money has the most power and decides where it goes. Well-intentioned, um, but, but how do we reframe that? And where can we, the church, you know, be involved in those conversations and, and, you know, and be leaders, I think, I think part of our mission is being leaders in community conversations. Um, I think, I, I think there's so much that, that God's church um, has to, to offer the world, you know, in, in, through that uh, scriptural witness that speaks to, you know, not just people of faith, but, you know, those moral and civic um, and, and theological questions, you know, many of which really merge together. I'm really fascinated by that quote. I've, I've never heard that before. And, um, and thinking about humanity and the human person, I'm going to really take that with me and do some thinking about that, a couple of things come to mind for me. Um, one of them is um, I happen to glance through a publication that comes monthly, and I think it might be called Philanthropy Today. And it's a national um, magazine, so to speak. And um, as, I, as I look at the stories in there, it's showing the development in the United States of, of truly philanthropy, people with pretty massive wealth in many cases, but the way that these uh, foundations, charities, are forming their staffs now to recognize that the staff must reflect the diversity of those who have the needs they're meeting. And so um, I've not been in a boardroom of a large you know, philanthropic organization before, but what it says to me is the recognition that those with means, whether their means is I'm giving $20 a week or I'm giving a million dollars, um, are recognizing that their giving will be formed by the human, not just the human need, because there's also creation, but the need before them. So I, I do think uh, my sense is that as our, our world grapples with uh, relationality, with um, the specificity of a person in a need, I feel like we're being called into that real encounter with the human person, the particular need. And I, I do want to just quickly mention creation. I think it was Marge who noticed this picture back here, an, an image from uh, related to Laudato Si. And so the work of Pope Francis in calling us to recognize our globe, our world, our universe, really, as being also um, a creature, uh, an entity, a, a, a living being, organism, that includes human persons, but that really we need to see our place in that broader creation, our place with each other, and see before we act with our resources, physical, uh, personal, or monetary. Great. Thank you both. I'm going to quick switch the camera view. And so as we had shared at the beginning, it, a key aspect of this signal process it's not that just that we listen to a, a couple of speakers, but that we also listen to one another, that we practice what it means to be a listening church. And so we'd like to move into an opportunity for small groups for you to share at your tables. And online, we're going to be um, inviting you to join a breakout room, uh, unless you're already with a group of people and you're welcome to talk amongst yourselves uh, or in small groups of, I would say, three or four. 
and to reflect on what you've heard. But what is your own reflection on what it means to share in the common mission? And especially what are the areas that you think that across, uh, among all of the body of Christ, including the various churches and, and Christian denominations, what are arenas where we can share in that common mission to be not only uh, the lover of the people in front of us, the persons in front of us, but also in that other aspect of development and, and advocating for changing the road to uh, make sure that the road is protected. Perhaps also offering your own reflections on your own sense of what it means to be co-responsible for your neighbor's good. Especially those of you on Zoom, uh, this opportunity for us to have a large group conversation and do ask that um, both for those in the room and for those of you on Zoom, I, I'll, I can manage given the size of the group um, with looking to see if you unmute yourself that you'd like to speak, but it would really help if you use the raise hand function because then it'll move you up to the top of the screen. In fact, on that note, let me remove spotlight. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so if anyone would like to share something, uh, some of the fruit of your conversation, we'd invite you to, to do that at this time. Or if you have questions for either of our presenters, um, you're, you're certainly welcome to offer those at this time as well. But we'd love to hear back from some of the, maybe the headlines from your small group conversation or some of the fruits. What were some of the fruits of your reflection? Yes, Sister Lucille, let me get you the. I would just say that um, one of our participants um, is very involved in Westminster um, Presbyterian Church in the Together West Michigan. And um, his comment was um, as they're working on one of the issues, I think it's early child, um, early, early childhood care um, and development. He was just really amazed at the complexity of um, the issue. And, um, and that is what just really struck him, and how complex it is and how many different groups are out there and the needs are so different and complex um he said it's not an easy um you know uh effort to make it, it really takes a lot of um collecting the data finding out what's out there um anything else bob that you would say no. Yeah, that that's um, one of the things that um, was something that I was um, interested in. And I think one of the things is that how much we don't know, you know. And I, I I'm always reflecting, what don't I know? And I was, I was, I shared on our synodal process, and I didn't know the stories of so many people in the parish as we went through that. I mean, it was really, it was very moved by that, and uh, I'm just, just how unaware we may be, you know. And, and the other thing uh, I would say is, um, as our speakers talked about young people today and wanting to solve some of the big issues, um, it might be up to some of our elders to recognize the complexity of the issues, whereas young people might not see the complexities in trying to solve some of the issues. Thanks, sister. How about at this table here? Anyone want to offer some thoughts? Mary? Oh, thanks. Mark. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, um, I guess when we talked about the co-responsibility, I did learn a lot about the... Um, together West Michigan. So I'll be honest with you, it was the first time I've heard of it. So um, I think it's a, a wonderful venture. I love that um, there is this unity 
and all they're not just they're addressing all different issues i mean you talked about transportation mental health refugees, refugees i mean child care um so you know now the the thing is why didn't i know about that you know i mean i'm so how do we get i mean i'm not my church is over at st paul's so we're a different economical area you know a giving giving church but we are not here in the heart side so that's the other part for me it was like well i'm not i'm not being critical of anything but i'm just saying how do you get that word out more you know i guess that's a whole nother committee isn't it <laughs> Up to you, Mary. Oh, thank you, thank you, sister. <laughs> so, so I would, I would, I think a, a, a brief response to that is, you know, that kind of of work is very relational. So it's fairly new. Um, there were, uh, you know, it formed um, formally this past year, but there's been four years of relational relational meetings literally one-on-ones um for the course of four years just to begin with you know kind of a core base of 20 institutions so that work is continuing so that which again back to the theme of co-responsibility right um as we build relationships with one another and individually you know we learn what our passions are what our god-given uh, calls are and um, and can respond to that. Oh yeah. Um, because a lot of times people said I can't do the big thing. I guess well. The priest, um, we do think of the widow's might in scripture, and you know, nothing's too small. But I think my struggle is I can give, I write the check, and I have a real passion for inner city and homelessness and poor because God's heart is for that. You see that all the way through scripture. But, um, well, how do I go from that end, as you were talking, uh, Lynette, the, the development of me doing more? Um, and not just saying I'm, it's I'm doing my part, that someone else do the one on one. But and that and the other side of that coin is that we all have one on ones. We all have human relationships. And I love what um, you said, to Marion, right? Maureen. What is it? Maureen. Maureen. I'm sorry. Okay. I knew it was an M word. But um, um, to see the human in front of you, that's that's your mission. At that moment, could be the cashier at the grocery store or the homeless person in the street and um i don't give to every homeless person but there's times that god says that's the one and i go okay okay and that's clear and i think should i give to everyone and i have that desire to but i you know i can't um this happened in florida last year where this family was on a corner in a grocery store area selling roses and it was the whole family and they're just trying to raise money. And um, I drove by them and my wife the same way. And we got in the store and said, that's a whole family. They're on the corner. They're not asking for it. They're selling roses and they want to make money for their family. And I couldn't get out of my head and got out in the car and said, we need to go and do something with them. And, and they're not just standing there begging. They're, they're trying to do a business selling flowers on the corner. Um, so it's just the person that's in your presence that that's your mission is. I want to just respond. I mean, that's really powerful. I think that, right, the, the, the issues are so big that we can really feel paralyzed. Um, you know, Sister Marine used the word ecosystem, right, as mission is an ecosystem. Well, I also think, you know, that those those big human needs, it's also an ecosystem, you know, poverty, race, um, you know, economic segregation, 
education um, inequities, they're all so interrelated. Um, and so I think it's really freeing to say, okay, what's my passion? Where am I called? And if it's in this one area, if my passion is education, it will make a difference on all the others. It will make a difference. Sister Maureen, did you want to? Yeah, I, um, we probably have all heard that story about the little boy and the starfish on the, the sand. So, so the one thing we do does make a difference and the ripple impact we cannot tell what it will be um so i i would totally agree we 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 see something and do it there i think the other the other thought as you were talking uh came to me was in seeing that person in front of you um you start asking the why so why is it that family ended up at the corner needing to sell roses i wonder what happened to them were they evicted? Could we change our system where we'll give assistance before you're evicted in order to avoid it? I mean, I think the why question of the the instance that presents itself and, and address it as you can, and then walk away wondering why. Um, so I, I just think that's a powerful question. And what more might I be invited to be a part of? Um, the other thought that occurs to me, I uh, as a Dominican sister, we have uh, changes going on on our campus out at Marywood. So our offices are temporarily down here on Sheldon. And I'm about two blocks down. We're right across from the Cherry Health Clinic. And so my daily reality out my window these days is very different than on the green lush grass at Marywood, which also is a, an entity of service. And so not to deny that we need beauty in our lives, but Gosh, every day now, again, I have um, that chance to say, why is that happening to that person? And what could we do sort of upstream to make some changes? So again, that's that co-responsibility for mission. Jesus healed individuals, but he also challenged the system. Well said. <clears throat> how, uh, how about from our folks online? If anyone would like to offer some fruit or from, from the group at Marywood, Sister Joy Sand. You just need to unmute yourself. There you go. No, we had a lively discussion here and went around several kinds of topics. And one of them was looking at philanthropy and that that is a, a good, and it goes to good projects. But there's also the aspect that is the project what the person needed, were they involved with the decision? Mm -hmm. And so therefore that is that establishing the relationship. I was glad to hear that um, Lynette says, it took four years for um, West Michigan um, mm -hmm. to come about. I mean, the, the, the program, because I only heard about it when it was having its formational meeting last September. And Bob Sadowski was the one who came and asked, well, don't the Dominican sisters want to be represented there? And at that time, it was like, um, I don't know about what we are doing. And he said, well, you're a good one. You could put the word out. And I know it went out, but you know, it's like everything else. It went out that there is such, I want to say that it was announced. But we did not have any, there are like the 10 issues that people go to. And so it's like, we've got to latch on to the gifts that we have and then work with it from there. But I am glad to hear that um, that is proceeding. But I was also glad to know that there's all kinds of work and the complexity of the issues that, you, that one works with. So um, anyway, we were just wanting to be able to, that, Whoever we give to, if we can involve, and I think Maureen's question of why is that person in need is getting to a deeper issue. Anyone Great. else here? Thank you. Thanks, Sister Joy Sand. Sandy, I see your hand raised. Go ahead. Um, our group went around several different things, but one of the things we talked about and Sister Maureen did too is all the effects from COVID. Um, I am a member of the cathedral. You know, our food pantry was stopped all during COVID. When we started back up, people just poured in the food, you know, 
We have five the local churches that did that for Westminster. So things are changing. And uh, I, I, the past employee of Mel Trotter, so I reached out to them when Together West Michigan was starting. They they didn't want anything, you know, they did not, not want anything to do it. They didn't need anything else to do. Well, now we're trying to get volunteers there. You know, I just brought them socks from our clothing room. So now if I ask them, there's going to be a different response maybe because Together West Michigan is getting no. So mm -hmm. thank you. Great. Thanks, Sandy. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Stacy, Julia? I guess uh, what I got from it was that, um, like Maureen, uh, Sister Maureen had said, uh, we have to walk together. We have to, um, once we leave the church, the building is, we're leaving the building, but the church is with us still mm -hmm. going out. And um, sometimes that's hard to do. Some days are, are more difficult than others, but uh, we have to be able to reach out and walk together. And uh, I was talking to a friend today because I needed help. And he says, you know, unless I open the box, my gift box, I, I you you, it doesn't it, it doesn't let itself out so you gotta let the gift out and share it with others mm. so i guess that's what we have to do is is reach out to others uh not just at home comfortably thinking um there's nothing i can do either letter writing or phone calling is another way though too i found out during covid time oh yeah i made calls mm -hmm. while i was at home reach out to people that I knew was alone, particularly. Julia, I think that's a great example of ways that, I mean, we, we may think we can't get out and about very well, but there is still ways we can share in this mission. Mm -hmm. And you named a couple of great examples of how we can help, especially address during COVID, some of the isolation and loneliness that people felt and even loneliness that people still feel. I don't know if people are aware of this, but the, um, U.S. Surgeon General, one of the five priorities of the U.S. Surgeon General's office is addressing loneliness as a mental health crisis in the United States. And they have a lot of great resources on that as well. Stacy, go ahead. Thanks, Mark. Um, I, I think that idea of loneliness and the time during COVID, um, I think calls the attention to me some other groups, um, people who are incarcerated, um, the lack of restorative justice in our world. You know, how many, how many um, groups, how many individuals are relegated to, to the margins? And when we use that word really um, broadly, and yet really bring it down to, we put people in boxes for their entire lives. Give them. No, no chance. And that's not only true with people who are incarcerated, but it's true with people who are impoverished for a lifetime in the communities that are around us. Mm. Um, you know, I think for me, COVID really raised that sense of, of, of just hopelessness for groups of people um, and, and a sense of how can I be there for the person that's not quite there yet? How, who's on the edge right now that I know? Who's, who is just struggling mentally, struggling um, you know, with just the world on their shoulders? Um, how do I be there for them? Like Julia said, the letter, the phone call, the meal, the, um, the listening and also helping them seek out solutions. What are those solutions that, that exist? Um, or what are some of the systems? I think what this community is really facing is an overwhelm to the systems, whether it's mental health care, whether it's health care, um, whether it's lack of homes, you know, um, it's, it's at all, all levels. And, Listening, to, I, I, I'm curious more. I'm curious about the um, this 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 group that I was talking about. I'm sorry, I just 
lost the name of it again. The but Together West Michigan? Because it is actually bringing the systems, some of the people that are engaged in the systems to the table as well. But, you know, um, we've got to get the lawmakers on, you know, at, at the table too. Um, what are the codes? What are the policies? What are the permits? What are the barriers that prohibit us from feeding people, that prohibit prohibit us from putting people in housing, that prohibit us from not sending people to jail for a lifetime for um, because of an institutionalized um, institutionalized um, criminal a criminal criminal system, you know, um, and a for profit one at that. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So COVID for me um, really made me think about the, those who are alone. Great, Stacy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Sister Maureen or Lynette, do you want to offer some closing remarks? And then I'll have some announcements. Sure. I think my closing remark would be that this is just the beginning of a conversation and, and the beginning or the next beginning, if you will, of the conversation and the work together. So, um, uh, it's it's been a, a joy and an honor to be part of this and uh, know that it will continue to bear fruit. Yeah, I would echo that as well. It has been a joy to, to be a part, to, to listen to the stories that you brought to us as well. Um, and I think uh, something Sister Julia said also reminded me our, our recognition that in this life of service and, and being out on mission, um, in so many ways, we are the beneficiaries because we meet God's people and God's creation and it changes us. And so to recognize the mutuality of blessing, just as this evening has been, uh, that's what service is as well. Well, thank you both for sharing your insights and reflections to help be a catalyst for conversation as well as further reflection on our part. Um, I, I do want to affirm something, um, Stacy. I think you were pointing to it, that it's, it's not the differences among Christians that really are the obstacle or divide us. It's a lot of other things going on in the world that are the obstacles to being able to help move forward together in our mission. Um, and, and I think you named that in a very prophetic way. Um, and it, then brings me to the idea of, so then what, what can we do to reach out across denominations? And Sister Maureen, you mentioned the synodal document, the title of the synodal document at this phase of the synod in the continental phase. And the title is to enlarge our tents. And that comes from Isaiah chapter 54, verse two, where Isaiah says, enlarge the space of your tent, spread out your tent cloths unsparingly, lengthen your ropes, and make firm your pegs. I think there's something about that, you know, God's, God's idea of church is so much larger than ours, right? So we are really called to continually enlarge our tents, to make room for the other, to make room for one another as we share in this common mission. So thank you again, Lynette, yeah. Maureen, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us today. Those of you here in person and those of you online, we're so glad that this kind of technology can bring us together and interact in ways that, that we never really, well, we could before, but now it's just so much more accessible and so glad that you could join us. I wanna offer a reminder that events like these would not be possible without the contributions of our friends and associates. So thank you for your contributions here and your financial support, your support and encouragement, both are indispensable. Thank you. Uh, we do, I want to do give a shout out to Together West Michigan. I'll, when I send a follow-up email, I'll include a link to their website. They are a community broad-based organization of, as Lynette said, 20 uh, organizations, both religious and um, nonprofits like Access West Michigan and the Grand Rapids Food Co-op are part of it, as well as the Cathedral and Westminster Presbyterian. St. Mark's Episcopal is also a member. And, to broaden it. And, and we need to widen the, we need to widen the tent. We Absolutely. need to extend exactly. the ropes. 
Uh, so if you want to find out more about how to get engaged in the work of this coalition, uh, we invite you to check out or talk to Lynette and, uh, and we'll be able to get that information to you. And I know Sandy and Bob Enders are both very involved as well as Mary Morris and Bob Sadowski, so they can also tell you more about that. But we do hope that you're able to join us if you're not already registered to be part of our Paulist Feast Day celebration. Wednesday on the church and the Catholic Church's calendar is the conversion of St. Paul, which is the feast day for the Paulists. And we have invited Father Ferdinand O'Corey, who's a New Testament scholar and vice president of Catholic Theological Union, as well as editor of the U.S. Catholic, to share with us his reflection on the question you know, St. Paul wrote, he was always preaching Christ crucified and risen, hands down. But in all his letters to the Corinthians, to the Romans, he always talked about, well, what does that look like in practice? And we asked him, so if St. Paul was on mission today, what would he say in a letter to, the, to us here in the United States? The letter to the Americans, for lack of better words. Uh, so we hope you can join us. That's next Wednesday morning. Uh, and that presentation will be here at the Catholic Information Center, but will also be on Zoom. Uh, and then our ecumenical dialogue and synod conversation continues February 1st. We are welcoming the Reverend Nuria Parish of Plainsong Farm and of the Episcopal Church and spiritual director and Catholic author Brian Plakta will offer their insights on the practice of dialogue in church and society. And all those details are on our website. So. Again, let me uh, just close in prayer with the words of Isaiah, the call of the Lord to enlarge the space of our tent, spread out your tent cloths unsparingly, lengthen your ropes, and make firm your pegs. Amen. Amen. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.